special guest, uh, Ruchu Sharma. Um, can I give a quick show of hands before we start? How many of you have like read something that he's written in the last? Okay. <laughs> so I so the pressure is on us, Shamal, now to talk about things that he hasn't already spoken about because we all have a room full of uh, people who are following his work. Ruchu, thank you for making time. Thank you for being here at the Adda. It's not your first time with us at the at the Adda, but we're still very excited to have you because. It, it is the right time to talk to you. There's so much that's changing. There's changes in the world order, there's the changes economically in India, China, India, US relationship with China, Russia, the war, there's so much that's kind of changing. I think the one thing that sort of interests me the most, and I think we can maybe start with, um, is, is China. I find it a very, obviously it's, it's, it's a very opaque place. We don't really know what happens there. And you have been talking and commentating about China for many years. So if we can, if I can get you to start with China, um, you know, can you just paint a picture for us? How much really at odds is India with the Chinese grand plan? Uh, is it, is there a world, is there a scenario in the world where India and China can coexist in harmony, growing peacefully? Or will there always be some kind of uh, tension between us? Yeah, I think that as far as China is concerned at this stage, given the fact that its economic miracle is over, uh, it is generally sort of, I'd say that their focus is likely to be much more on geopolitics, nationalism. So I think that naturally makes for a much more tense relationship. Uh, so I think that the key thing, as far as I'm concerned, I think geopolitics is something which is very speculative. On the economic front, I think now there's widespread recognition, something we spoke about in the previous Addas as well, and at that point in time, it wasn't that clear. But I think that the economic miracle in China is over. And that, I think, has major consequences in terms of its behavior, which is that you should expect, therefore, a China which is much more assertive, China which is much more focused on geopolitics, and a China that op may even need more foreign distractions uh, than the fact that, you know, with the domestic economy not in such a great position anymore. So, so the waning popularity of Xi Jinping is a clear correlation to the fact that the economic sort of miracle of China, as you say, is over? There's no way for me to tell you that his popularity is waning. I think that the biggest mistake that all of us tend to make is that it, we think uh, in terms of the westernized way, which is that there's a very clear link between economics and politics, that the economy is not, not doing well, so the, it means the leader will be unpopular. That's not necessarily true uh, because of the fact that in some of these places you're able to whip up national sentiment, you have a different ideological stuff. He is sort of trying to come up with a very different vision of what he thinks the, the world should look like. And for him, some of the Western values of too much materialism, too much consumerism, is something which he seems antithetical to. So that's not what he is his uh, priority. So, so this idea that his popularity is waning is something we, you, we just you, don't you, know. You, 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 you aren't saying is a fact. You, 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 don't, you don't know, but you're, not, you're yeah. not saying it's not true. You just don't know. But. I just don't know in terms of what is his popularity on the ground in China. It is very hard to know. And how do you think uh, we have been responding to the changes in China? I mean, if you were to rate Indian government's response to the changes in China, how would you? I'm not sure the Indian us? government's really sort of taken a big sort of uh, position on this, but what's very clear is the stock market community is very elated by it, right? Because in India, you can make out there's so much sort of feeling that because of China's fading away, there's no doubt that the foreign interest in India this year in particular, at least 50% of the increased foreign interest in India this year, I would say, is because of the uh, fading economic miracle in China and the fact that the China is being increasingly cut off from uh, the Western uh, world. I think that is a really big factor today as far as the Indian market's concerned. That's played a very big role, I think. And is it, I mean, is it, you see this being a, a sort of a short-lived thing because China relationship is like this, that's why there's a focus on India? Or is it a sort of an independent trend that the focus on the Indian market 
uh, whether even if tomorrow, let's say, uh, you know, America and China become best friends, will that not sustain the in, in, in foreign... No, but I think there's no doubt that it's been inflated just now, right? So as far as, let's say, there was an interest in India, it's been inflated. Um, I was glad to meet a lot of people today who I've known for nearly three decades in the business, and I think that they will agree with me that this is really the fourth wave we have seen of great foreign interest in India, uh, the fourth wave. The first wave was in the 91 to 94 phase, right? When we first opened up uh, to the rest of the world, uh, that's when you saw the first massive wave of foreign interest. The second wave happened in 99, 2000, when you had the tech boom, uh, which took place in the NASDAQ tech. India's tech prowess got very widely recognized in that, in that, in that boom. The third wave happened in the mid-2000s. You know, that was the true India rising when all emerging markets were booming. That was a giddy boom that we saw in the 2000s, which came with all its other sort of uh, issues. This, I think, is the fourth real wave we are seeing of great foreign interest in India, uh, where we are. And my only cautionary tale, because I was speaking to the team about, is that the Fourth wave has been such today that India today is the most expensive market in the world. It's the most expensive stock market in the world. Singular. There is no... Uh, so it just tells you about what expectations also are out of India. Because when you're the most expensive market in the world, it means valuations are very high. When you, valuations are very high, it means expectations are very high. So even I can't find it too much wrong with the Indian economy today. I think it's in, it's in very good shape. The macro... Numbers look great, demand's doing very well, profitability of companies is doing very well. But as an investor, you're always trained a bit to think of, okay, how much is priced in? What can possibly go wrong? So I was just mapping it in my head. Fourth, big wave, the most expensive market in the world. The last time we had this honor was December 2007. So we just have to be a bit sort of mindful of where we are today. In spite of that, in spite of the fact that we're so expensive, our combined market cap is still less than Apple's. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends how you measure, but yeah. I think that's true of all... Im that's true, that the U.S. as a financial superpower has never been this dominant in history. So it, anything compared to the U.S. looks but super... One, but one super in terms of market cap. Yeah, because in the U If you look at the top 10 companies in the world today, I think ex uh, with the exception of Aramco, all the top 10 companies today are all American. So it's a decade where America has totally dominated. Now, there are two ways of looking at it. As you said, on one hand, you compare to Apple. On the other hand, India's market cap today is now today, possibly, I think it's the fourth largest in the world yep. uh, combined uh, after Obviously, U.S., China, Hong Kong, you know, like possibly Japan, somewhere there. But that's where you are. So it depends who you look. Every market in the world today looks cheap compared... Or not cheap, at least in the market cap compared to the U.S. But India on its own today, I mean, in terms of the thing, is great. So, yeah, long-term bullishness on India, I feel very good about. But going back to the original question, there's no doubt that we have been, this year, got a real push because of the fact that there's a lot of disenchantment with China among global investors. And that's the main difference between this wave of bullishness to the previous wave of bullishness. Yeah, so there's always some different catalyst. This wave of bullishness has been catalyzed a lot by the fact there's so much disenchantment with China and then there is no other country, large emerging market, that people can dream of except India. I want to get into some details about the differences between this wave of bullishness and the previous one. Bashamal, you want to go at first? Yeah, uh, just a question on the dollar. You know, we have been talking, dollar has been trending lower and it's happening for some time. Now, a lot of uh, countries, they are now readying themselves for a post-dollar world, when they're getting off the dollar standard. And you see bilateral deals being worked out, China is investing in bonds of other countries, et cetera, et cetera. So that has given rise to the narrative that we are growing slowly into a post-dollar world. But the question is, how much of it is hype and how much of it is real? Because there is no uh, currency, alternative currency in sight. China obviously cannot be the solution. So how do you make sense of this grand uh, plan of uh, a new, brave, post-dollar world? 
Yeah, so you're right. So far, it is all talk. Because if you look at the dollar itself, it is still very strong uh, in terms of that, right? The dollar is extremely strong today. Um, if, I mean, in its 50-year in, in its history, the dollar today is at the top end of its uh, range compared to most currencies. Uh, so I think that the post-dollar world is because I think America made one very key strategic mistake, if I can say so which is the way they imposed sanctions on Russia uh, last year. Because, you know, when you impose sanctions that way, you may be completely morally correct in doing it, but when you are weaponizing the currency to do something like that, I think it led to a lot of pe uh, governments around the world thinking that if U.S. can throw Russia off the dollar standard, what will, you know, we better protect ourselves from being thrown off the dollar standard. So that, I feel, is a very key strategic mistake that America has made. Um, and I think that its consequences will be played out over time. So it won't happen immediately. And, you know, this entire idea that there is no alternative, it's a Tina phrase we use in Indian politics today. It's a Tina phrase we use, like, even there. I'm very skeptical of this because nature always finds a way of coming up with an alternative. Like, even today, for example, you know, like, the dollar in terms of people are shedding the dollar holdings. They are buying more of uh, the central banks. They are buying more of Swiss francs, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, even gold they have been buying a lot more of. So people figure out ways of finding alternatives. But, I, yes, the dollar being displaced as the world's reserve currency is a multi-decade process. It's not going to happen in... But has it started? I think that the seeds of it have been sown and... The, that the, and by that, America's own doing. By America's own doing because of, there's always this hubris. It's, it's there in America today also that we can, we are the world's only economic power today. We can do what we feel like. So America today, you know, for, like one thing which really uh, the, um, I also said about, today America is running a budget deficit of 6% of GDP a year. And it's projected to run 6% budget deficits for the rest of this decade or close to that. America's debt today, if you look at its total debt in terms of that, is the third highest in the, in the developed world after only, I think, Japan and maybe Italy or something. So, you know, they're pushing on a string, but they think they can get away with anything because they have the world's reserve currency, where else are people going to go, the tech boom is, uh, again, unfolding uh, with artificial intelligence, America's at the forefront of it. So there is this real confidence that where else will the money go except come to America. But I do feel that the seeds are being sown, therefore, because people are looking for alternatives around the world. Just uh, coming back to India, you know, yesterday, uh, Jai Shankar gave a speech and he talked about re-globalization. We had globalization, we had de-globalization, now he's talking about re-globalization, where India is at the center of it all and no country can afford to ignore India. How much do you think it, this is political grandstanding or has India done enough to actually earn its place there? If you look at the data, you will see that there is a very clear shift which is going on of supply chains around the world. But India is not the only beneficiary, India is one of the beneficiaries. Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Mexico, uh, you know, in terms of very close to what's happening to the US and stuff. You, ha you know, there in Eastern Europe, uh, countries like Poland. So you see that there is a general that any corporate, you know, like um, think about an American CEO sitting home, right? Which is that for the last two decades, they set up lots of in, uh, factories and all in China and some in other countries, some smaller ones in Russia. Last year, what happens to them? That in Russia, their investments got written down to zero in one day, right? Because you got sanctions on Russia, they're thrown off the dollar standard. So let's say, like, you're a multinational, U.S. multinational, any multinational operating in, China, in Russia, all of a sudden your investment, your entire enterprise value in Russia got literally written down to zero. I've never seen something like this happen because of sanctions have gone off. That happened. You could go back to your board and justify to your board, hey, that this is a real black swan event, it happened now. Now, the even the 10-20% risk is that China does something with Taiwan. And the Western world again takes a measure like that. The, the probability, I agree, is very small, but it's not zero. Can you imagine a, a CEO then having to go back to their board and justify that 
I have so much in China, and I'm you know, like, going to do that here. So therefore, every CEO is thinking about how to have a, at least a China plus one strategy, and India is definitely a beneficiary of that. It goes back to my original theme, that this is what's causing. But again, we have to be careful in India of a couple of things, which is that we're not the only country. There are options people have. There are markets like Indonesia, Mexico, Vietnam, and all which people have. And secondly, that you know, the policy on the ground, right? that the macro numbers look good. On the ground, what's really happening? For example, you look at the FDI numbers into India. Those have really fallen off quite uh, significantly. Why is that happening? You know, we need more of that sort of FDI to come. Private capex. Why is private capex in India not picking up more in the way it should be? So these are some of the answers that I would like, I hope our policymakers also think about, rather than take it for granted that, you know, I wrote my Breakout Nations book in 2012, and my, in the opening chapter, I had captured the sentiment, because even then, the bullishness on in India, when I wrote the book in 2011, was a lot. Uh, and I'd said that, I'd, I'd captured this comment that some, at some farmhouse that some young kid made to me, that where else will the money go but come to India? This was in 2011, uh, in terms of that. So we just have to be careful of not being caught in the same trap, which is that this thinking that where else will the money go? It's got to come to India. Yes, India is great. The prospects look fantastic. But we just can't take it for granted that this is the only thing. And the data on the ground today shows, yes, India is benefiting from the China plus one strategy. But it's not just India. There are other countries, too, which are trying to pick up the pieces and do this. Some doing it more quietly, some with more fanfare. Just to borrow from uh, your article in FT, uh, recently you wrote about uh, many states in Asia first gained economic freedom and then political freedom as they grew richer. Yeah. But in India, a poor nation got political freedom but got wedded into a socialist kind of an economy uh, with no real conviction in, in uh, economic uh, freedom. Now, given that context which you have written, do you think that, uh, you know, or since our political DNA is basically fundamentally, you know, uh, statist, socialist, yeah. socialist, do you think this, in, in order to break out, people are talking about an 8% plus growth rate for a sustained period of time. Do you think this, this is just a dream or, as you have written, said that 5.5 to 6% growth itself is in doubt and given the prevailing economic uncertainties, it will take a lot more. Incremental reforms won't do. Do you see now that the pre present government is finishing its second term and getting into a third term, hopefully? I don't know wh what will happen. But uh, uh, do you think that the, this incremental reform mindset, will it change? Or, or, uh, no, it's very difficult in India because even if you look at the state elections which are taking place now, the big risk is that we get into competitive populism, right? Because every state is announcing more and more sort of measures about what to do. And this, just, and this is not just a budget deficit impact. It's a culture impact. That if you put up a welfare state too prematurely, you prevent people f moving from the rural areas to urban areas. That slows down the transition. Uh, it, in terms of, like, the work culture gets a bit sort of distorted. You know, these sound like very heartless comments to make. But if you look at China as an example, China had no welfare state. They were like, you know, they f China in its, private, uh, in its public sector enterprises in the 1990s fired 70 to 80 million people, fired. Can you imagine in India, we firing even 2,000 people at a public sector enterprise? It's like, you know, how difficult that is. Uh, similarly, a lot of people in China were made to move forcibly almost to the, uh, to the eastern coast where, you know, the ports, the, uh, to be, uh, from the inland to that, you know, go east was the policy in terms of that. It was almost done forcibly. So these kind of policies you can't do in India. So it's not, so you have to be mindful of what is the DNA for country, what's a societal stuff in a country. And even now, there is a lot of statism, right? Because in India, it's impossible to privatize anything. In fact, in India, if you find anything, it's all privatization by what I've said, malign neglect almost, right? Which is that you don't like telecom, uh, air, uh, air, uh, airlines, there's no privatization. It just is that the banking sector. So over time, 
their share just goes down and all the, and the shares of the others goes up. Like, I was speaking to some friends of mine that, you know, and like, like the hospital business today in India, it's like the private sector is again having a free march almost because you're competing against government hospitals where the salaries and wages and unionization is so high and the, and you, like you don't have the proper thing. So you, the private sector guys are just like on a free tier. So that's the way India functions, which is that there is very little deliberate policy action. Things happen almost by neglect. And that's how the private sector grows. In that scenario for us to you know, do what East Asia did, where it was command, okay, we are, we are privatizing, we have no welfare state. Let's first build the bridges and the infrastructure. We'll do welfare state later. We can't do that in this country. So, you know, wh so why is it then that, you know, we keep hearing this refrain after all that you said, we keep hearing this kind of thought that, you know, we need a very stable government. If Modi doesn't come back, markets will crash. Now, is this something which is being painted by a political uh, side of an argument or is it true? I, I feel like I've heard this from like people with money, like people who want to invest in India. I feel like I've heard them say things like, listen, if there's no strong government in India, it's going to like impact how we think about investing here. So is that true, by the way? Like, do, like, do, does foreign capital want? Yeah, I think the foreign cap, yeah, I think that, you know, foreign capital gets very, or any capital gets very comfortable with the incumbent, right? I remember, like, you know, again, I think that uh, this may be the problem of, there's a really old Russian proverb which goes that uh, ignore history and you lose an eye, focus on it too much and you lose both. So, you know, you have to have the right balance between how much history to know and not know. But again, my mind goes back in 2004, when the Vajpayee government lost unexpectedly. No yeah. one expected yeah. it. The market fell 20% in a flash. It was limit down almost, right? It was like limit down, flash, etc. All these communist party guys were running around saying lots of irresponsible stuff about economically. And yet, what happened after that was that you got the biggest stock market boom that India has seen. Uh, you know, like in that and foreign capital rushed in. So I think that, and I've always said this, that a country's growth is dependent on many factors, not one. So I'd say that generally having a business-friendly, stable government, you can argue is helpful. But there are nine other factors that you need to take care of. So you had the worst in terms of like, you know, today people only have bad memories of the UPA and stuff like that. But there were other factors which came into play. You had a massive global emerging market boom. India, you know, like just took off on the back of that. And you know, the government was spending a lot then on welfare. But the revenues kept on pouring in because the boom went on until the tide ran out by 2010-11. And then the government was caught, you know, uh, in terms of it, lots of bills to pay. So I think that in, it's very important for us to, be, to not be ideological when you think about investing. And to keep in mind, as I've tried to write, that there, are, there are 10 rules of successful nations, not one. So let's not get focused on just one. When we evaluate countries, we look at 10 rules and not just one. But do we give too much, go ahead. No, do we give too much importance to foreign capital now? Because I feel like that, you know, we keep saying foreign, foreigners, especially like, you know, like we keep talking about this foreign bags of cash and we do everything we can. Governments, state governments are competing for it. Centrals keeps, you know, rolling out red carpet after red carpet. Have they actually been as responsible as we would have wanted them to be? I mean, you, you look at some of the big PE guys, how they've invested in startups. They've been extremely irresponsible in Indian startups. So wh wh yeah. why does India worship foreign capital like this? I mean, does it ha I, mean, I know we need, we need, of course, we need, we need capital, we need money. It can't all come from India. But are we, are we giving them too much importance? Yeah, I think there are two factors that put the first. In general, India has structurally got a current account deficit. So there's one, a math. That, you know, if you have a current account deficit, whatever, like you need to fund $100 billion a year or something, right? So you, there's a basic math. But the second point, I totally, I know where you're coming at, and I, and I agree with you, because one, I've always said this, if you look at the history of development, the single best indicator, if you were to look at it in terms of capital flows, is when, what's, what are the domestic businessmen doing? Very rarely have countries been successful if the domestic businessmen are bearish and the foreign people are putting money in. Usually it works the other way around, which is I would rather invest in a country where the domestic people are more optimistic than the foreign guys are. Often the foreign capital is the last one to, call, to come and catch the tail end of the boom. And the first to leave also. And the first to leave, no, opposite. The first to leave happens to be domestic guys. In fact, the best predictor of crises I figured out is when the domestic businessmen start taking their money out. 
That was my first experience in East Asia in 97, that before foreign capital could leave, domestic business people started taking their money out on the quiet, right? You, uh, you, uh, there are balance of payments numbers, we know where you look at it and, and you see that. So I think that, and I've made this point earlier, that it's the domestic businesses that I want to see remain more in India today. It's a great story which is going on, but if I were to look at one of the fault lines, it is that why are so many people, you know, moving to Dubai and Singapore, moving to Dubai, Singapore you go there, etc. they're floating around. And I think that a lot of it is because, and I've said this openly, that if, you know, that of all the good that's happening, one of the things which I'm, uh, I think the government needs to be careful about is that, you know, like how confident are you feeling about the domestic environment, domestic businesses, have the investigative agencies been weaponized too much where people, you know, don't know at any point in time what can happen. Being and I iced. Think, sorry? You're hearing this term iced. Yeah, iced, exactly. I mean, I, in terms of that, you know, like on the, as an acronym for the four investigative agencies. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that fear is there, uh, undoubtedly. And I'd say that both economically and politically, if there's one thing I'd say which uh, is, is concerning, uh, which should be concerning for the Modi government, it should be the weaponization of the investigative agencies. Economically, because what I've said, that you have domestic businesses yeah. who are there, and you, it's a question you have to ask that why are they not staying more at home and you need more private sector you know, confidence to come back, and I'm all for domestic businesses. And politically also, because you know, um, in terms of the fact that I was in Delhi briefly and you speak to people there, all the opposition parties, they, there's no common ideology, there's no common figure. The only reason that they are trying to unite is one, is because they feel an existential threat yes. about the fact that if these guys are coming after us, you know, in terms of it, everyone's feeling like an existential threat, that what will happen to us five years. So they're uniting secret, I mean, I'd say uh, subconsciously based on that. Overtly, they may say everything about, you know, ide ideological this and the other. This is a real factor if you really go to the bottom of it. So I'd say that if I were to say this is the single biggest issue in terms of that, if I was the Modi government, that I'd, you know, that I'd be yeah, watching out on. for. Yeah. Uh, just going back to Anand's earlier question, do you think the importance of elections is way too exaggerated in India on investment and markets? Because if you see the trend, state elections, yeah. Karnataka being the latest, I mean, the, their growth rate has been much above the national average. Do elections really matter for uh, investment, markets, and even politics? Uh, politics and economics connection that we often tend to make. Are we exaggerating it? Yeah, we, I mean, absolutely. Like, I, uh, you know, like, we have traveled a lot. I have some of my fellow members here for my election trip group and, and stuff that, you know, that we go on every time there's a major election. And we went Karnataka too, and we came back, I have to say, I know we, uh, a lot of people say, oh, do you get your assessment correct? This time, I think, we, at least we can say we did. We came back completely dazzled by Karnataka's economic progress. We, we traveled a lot. And yet, we were able to figure out that they will not win the election despite the economic progress. You're completely correct. In my previous book, Democracy on the Road, I did a piece of research which really stayed with me, which is that if you look at India, since we have data going back the last 40 years or so, there have been about 30 instances when a state's GDP, a state GDP, has grown at a rate of more than 8%, right? O over a five-year time horizon. 8% economic growth rate. Half of those governments lost election. This is unthinkable, in, like, when I say this to a Western observer, it's unthinkable for them. As you know, the word anti-incumbency was coined in India. So it's not a word that even in the West, they are familiar with. I mean, when I would write some pieces and I would use anti-incumbency, the editor would come I, back I, I to do. me and say, you know, like, what is this uh, in terms of that? So I think that this is a term which is coined in India. And the whole idea is that the connection between economics and politics in India, as you rightly point out, is very tenuous. There are, you know, like, I, I think as someone put it, like uh, one of the local candidates put us that, like in India, uh, an election is like doing a, uh, a six, uh, set of exams. There are six sets of exams you have to pass. Economics may be just one of them. The only th economic factor which matters in India is that high inflation. Never has a government won when inflation is high. But economic growth, it's so sort of, you know, uh, amorphous as to wh who's benefiting, who does that. 
but the connection between economic growth and politics in India is very uh, weak. But in, uh, I mean, in my view is that there is a, there may not be that much of a connection, and I, it's weak, I agree with you, but there is a certain connection if you're seen as too close to big business. That across all political parties, there is a sort of, you don't want to be seen as being too close to the corporates and being too close. Is, is that still the case, you think? Yeah, I think that's there, although I'd say that, I mean, I don't think that the, I mean, that the Modi government gets accused of the opposite, in fact. Uh, in of, terms of being, of, of, being of being close and stuff like that, and I think you that, think they get accused of being too close. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean that's the only. I'm not saying that, this. I mean that's close, the opposition yeah. saying yeah, 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 yeah. this. So I, you know, like in terms of that. So I think that they. I, so I, I'm not sure about this being too close to big business stuff. I think that the generally in India, the uh, in terms of that, you know, there is a socialist DNA yeah. uh, amongst the political class. I think that's true, but on, on big business. In fact, I still remember this conversation I had with uh, Mulayam Singh Yadav, like, about, you know, on, on one of the election trips years ago, that why do you so, you know, like, that, that you're so close to Amar Singh? Aren't you concerned that Amar Singh is so close to so many you know, industrialists? Yeah. And he rattled off on spot the history of how Mahatma Gandhi was so close to Birla, and, you know, the, like the whole history of Indian politicians being close to big business. So, I'd say that I'm not sure that, you know, that's as negative as we think it is. You have said that Indian billionaires are not the cleanest billionaires in the world, and they've always, m many of them have gotten here because of grace and favor with government. So, you know, has... But that's changed. So I have to say that when I look at my billionaire rule, I first created this rule back in 2011 based on India. But on the positive side, if you look at the billionaire wealth creation in India in the last... Uh, five years or so, it's very, I mean, like, to me, it's much more impressive. The problem I have with Indian billionaires in general, and there's nothing wrong with it, you know, but is the ratio, because my thing is that, okay, this is India, how the rest of the world? India, so in terms of, if you look at the number of billionaires India has created, so I've said that typically there's nothing wrong with billionaire wealth, but there are three sort of things you have to look out for when billionaire wealth begins to rankle and possibly lead to a societal reaction. There are three things you have to look out for. One, if billionaire wealth as a share of the economy gets too large. Two, if a lot of the billionaire wealth is being created in industries which are benefiting from government patronage, like, you know, like, you know which industry, some real estate, or et cetera. If there's too much of that happening, some is fine, too much. And third, if a lot of the billionaires are, are, on, are just inheriting the wealth rather than creating it, right? Those are the three things you should look out for. Nothing wrong in any of the three. It's when the three are out of balance. In India's case today, billionaire share of the overall economy today is relatively high. Inherited wealth is relatively high, but that's been India's DNA in terms of how it's been, the in inherited part. Where it's improved is that a lot of the new wealth has come in sectors such as, you know, like sectors such as um, um, manufacturing. I mean, I was shocked when I did the latest analysis that if you look at India's billionaire share, like over 100 or so, the biggest chunk of billionaires in India today are from the manufacturing sector. That's a huge change in terms of what was the case, let's say, five, ten years ago. Manufacturing, then healthcare, these have come out. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, a lot of them were things like real estate and, you know, those kind of stuff. So that change which has happened, I think, is something which is good for India. The, I mean, I know it's a very old question and almost a cliche to ask this question, but I want to ask it anyway. Was there any impact in foreign markets and in foreign investors after the Hindenburg thing came out? Briefly, or, I'd say briefly there was. All the cliches that it showed up, the India accountings and the other, but it was very quickly absorbed and, and, and they moved on. I think the good thing about India is the fact that it's an incredibly diverse market, which is not true of many emerging markets, which is that in many emerging markets are dominated by one or two sectors and possibly by a couple of industrial houses, you know? I think in India's case, it's a very diversified stuff. So there was a brief impact, but it got very quickly digested. And now, in terms of the fact that I don't think it has an impact. I mean, you know, you, you keep hearing speculation, something else will come, this will happen. I don't think the market cares about it anymore. So that's the good thing about India, that it's very diverse, and the ability to move on uh, that way is much more remarkable than other markets. Uh, you know, uh, as an investor, do you think the number of quality companies that one can invest in has shrunk over the years? Not in India. I'd say in India in terms of, compared to the other emerging markets, India's 
comparative advantage has always been the number of good quality companies you can invest in here. Uh, it's, and the size, right? In terms of that, the size is also meaningful. The number of companies with more than a billion dollar market cap, and if you just look at the last 10 years also, the number of companies with a billion dollar market cap, which have gone up four to five X, is quite incredible. In fact, as a share of the overall market, I'd say India is possibly the highest in the world, where the number of companies in India have generated returns of four, five hundred percent, even with a base starting base of a billion dollars. That's incredible. There's no other country as a share. In larger markets, the US, you have a lot of such things. But as a share of the overall market, India possibly is the best in the world. So quality-wise, that's why I'm trying to say that quality-wise, this market, yes, there's a lot of junk, but relatively, the you know, I mean, foreign investors, if you look at it, if you get 40 to 50 great companies, that pool to invest in with some size, that's a pretty meaningful number. So is this due to what is called the Modi phenomena, or is it because the foreign investors are looking at India with new, new fresh eyes? In terms of what are you talking about? The, uh, the stock market. No, the stock, as I said, there's, that it's a multi-factor phenomenon. This idea of India having good quality companies has been there for a uh, you know, like for a long period of time. A stock market culture in India has been there for a long period of time. The fact that I think that this has been accelerated in the last few years, if you ask me that one of the good things that the Modi government has done has been the way it has embraced digitization. This, you know, like so, a lot of people tell me, oh, this was actually an idea which came up by Nandan during the Congress regime. But even Nandan will tell you that the, the way they have embraced it, yeah. in, you know, like the, Modi, the way they have embraced digitization, and that's led to a digital economy coming up in India, has been, you know, quite exceptional. So I'd say that the, uh, so you know, these are always very complicated narratives in, we want to come up with straight correlations, but yeah, you know, I can come up with three great, three things which shouldn't have been done, but I'd say that digitization and the way that they've embraced it is definitely something which has propelled India and the market ahead and also possibly helping them electorally. Because one thing that we do when we travel India now is that, you know, like that whole Rajiv Gandhi statement earlier that only 15 pesa reaches, reaches the you. final, et cetera. I think that's been smashed, is my feeling. Which is that if you, when you go to the ground today, the number of people who are actually receiving the... They uh, believe in the government's... No, uh, uh, because they're receiving it. Yeah. You see, because the, like, even if that number has come down from 15 to 50%, there's no scientific way for us to know what the actual number yeah, is. Yeah. Even the numbers come down from, let's say, 15% to 50. Yeah. That's a huge delta. Even if 50% is getting pilfered. Uh, but I think other, some people will tell you it's much less than that. That is possibly one of the biggest changes that the digitization, the way it's been adopted, and the impact it's having. And that's possibly one reason why a lot of the state governments and even Modi have increased their re-election chances. For, that's possibly the single most important factor. Let's say that the re-election rate in India um, before, let's say five years ago, the re-election rate in India used to be about one in three, which is that between 1977 and let's say 50, you know, like nearly uh, till about um, uh, 2017. In that 50 year phase, about two out of three governments used to lose elections. Last five years, that number has become more like 50-50. And I can argue, I, and this is not just Modi, right? Because at the state level, in fact, the BJP is not doing that well. Yes. At the state level, it's the other parties which are doing well. I would say that the digitization and the fact that people are getting the direct benefits much more is making them less angry with governments, taking some of the edge away uh, in terms of the anger. So we've been uh, pushing and pushing you and to sort of just, I guess, validate for ourselves, are we in the right place at the right time? And it sounds like we are. I mean, I'm, we're, we're just... The bullishness that you've got to India and that you're seeing the world has is real and, it, and we're sort of at the right place at the right time. That's what I'm kind of getting. Yeah, I think that in terms of uh, geography and demography is really in India's favor today. There's, there's no doubt. I only say that as an investor or as someone who looks out that I always think about, we are trained maybe this way to look at what can go wrong when something is too priced for perfection. Yep. That's the term we use. The fact that the market is today trading at you know, like its most expensive uh, valuation multiple in its 
uh, in its history uh, in terms of that, or, you know, close to it compared to the rest of the world at yep, least. Yep. There have been instances where India has been even more expensive, yep. like in the mid-90s boom and stuff like that. But generally, this is the like, thing you have. You have to think about, okay, what, where are expectations and what may, can go wrong or even be exceeded in terms of where we are. So I'd say that, and uh, what I've tried to do, I think, is to point out to you that, yeah, uh, the story today is great. A lot of it is in the price. Where are we today? What can go wrong? And in terms of where, what should we be looking out for as the uh, potential fault lines? So I'm going to ask a very uh, e economically un uneducated question, and I, I, because I'm not an economist and I can ask that. You know, what happens 50 years later, right? Like we're talking about the demographic dividend of India and this, you know, this, how the world's growth is kind of slowing down because of demography. In India, our demographics are all for us. But what happens 50 years later when our replacement rate drops, when all this young population becomes old, we become spoiled with good housing, good healthcare, 8, 10, 12% increments every year. Uh, and we stop getting the foreign aid because by that time we will, you know, we yeah. would have had become so what happens 50 years later? You know, um, I don't know if any of you will remember this or not, but when I wrote my first book, I'd come up with a line there because similar projections were being made there about bricks and stuff. That the old rule of forecasting used to be that you make as many forecasts as possible and you keep reminding people when you're right. The new rule of forecasting is that you forecast so far out in the future that neither you nor I'll be here to know whether I'm right or wrong. So. As a rule, in my office, anywhere, in my writings, I have a very clear rule that no forecast will be made for more than maximum a decade. Anything more than that is useless. And, and the good news is, you know, there was a book which subsequently came out called Super Forecasters. And they tried to analyze what makes for great forecasting. And the, there were two things that they came up with. One, never have, that if you, look, if you talk to the good forecasters, they will never have full conviction. They'll always be like, you know, the, uh, as that old line goes, that, uh, uh, that the uh, certitude is a sure sign of mediocrity. So never be totally certain about it. And the second way rule which they came up with, saying that any forecast beyond five years is like, literally like throwing darts. So my short answer to that is, I have no idea, and I don't want to be intellectually dishonest. It's so easy for me to tell you. 50 years from this will happen, who cares, right? So, but I'd say that uh, as far as India is concerned, even in India's case, the demographics today are great compared to the rest of the world, but not as good as East Asia had because, India, because in many southern states and other parts of India, the replacement rates, the uh, birth rates have already come down a lot. Yes, yes. So it, that was my original question you, you know, as to why I say that it will be difficult for India to grow more than 5 6%. Partly it's because of demographics as well, that if you look at all the countries which grew demographic, uh, which grew very rapidly, 8-9% growth, all of them had their working age population increasing by more than 2 or 3% a year. All of them almost. There's no country which has grown at 8 to 9% without its working age population increasing substantially. In India's case, given the fact that the, you know, where the population growth rate is, it's very difficult for the working age population to grow that much more, unless you do something radical like pull in more women into the labor force because their participation rates are relatively low. And that goes back to my original sort of point we discussed on China, that in China's case, the population is now shrinking, actually shrinking, not just working age population, actually shrinking. In the history of economic development, there's never been a country that's grown at a rate of more than 2% when your population is, is like shrinking or, or you know, going down. That, because you can't generate so much productivity. Economic growth is the function of labor force and how productive they are. If your population is shrinking, how do you do that? So I think that the answer is that even for India, it's very hard to do 8 9%. Forget what the government does even. That's maybe because partly because the demographics are very good compared to the rest of the world. But even compared to India's past or other East Asian countries, the demographic profile has significantly changed now. And this is one thing that the finance minister has said uh, a few times publicly, and in one on one-on-one conversation, she mentioned this to me, is the one thing that bothers her the most is productivity. Yeah. Whether it is of, uh, of, of, of a plant and a machine or an industry, or whether it's of just human productivity. Uh, what can India do to improve productivity? No, I'd say that in terms of over time, what improves productivity is the fact that you have to, you know, like is tech 
R&D investments. That's the kind of stuff which improves productivity over time. In India's case, I'd say the productivity will keep improving as long as the state keeps getting out of the way. Because the more the state is in the way, the, most, the more unproductive it is. I mean, just look at that. You know, like, in, like in India's case, I mean, the public sector banks, the, like the telecom, I mean, like across the board, the productivity of the state in India is just so low, and you go and see it. But conversely, the digital payments infrastructure was done by the state. It yes. was not done by private sector. Yeah, but I'm saying that that, is, you know, that was boosted by the state. There's no doubt in terms of it because we were lucky there. But there are 9 out of 10 instances. Yeah. And of course. I mean, there's no rule that I can... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no, no, there's work no 10 out of 10. Yeah. E even ISRO, for what we're, what we're doing... It, I just find India very funny because the fact that the state can be so efficient and do things that no private sector could have done. Like, I don't think any private company would have landed in the moon the cost that it took for India to do... To, to get there, but right. still... No, there is something the state has to do. Yeah. Right? In India's case, in fact, I, I would argue that it's an allocation of resources. There are issues where the state is deeply underfunded. If you look at India, the number of judges we have, the number of police yeah. personnel of we have, compared to our you know, like, uh, population or even at this per capita income level, we are terribly understaffed. Yeah. So it's not as if the state has no role, but, should this, but what has the government done in terms of removing the state from businesses? I think that is the key thing, right? Which is that in many businesses, why does India have the highest share of public sector banks in the world as a share of its overall uh, savings? Its its overall banking sector, right? There's no reason. So now, should the uh, public sector banks not be there? No, they should be there. But other countries, the share is one third. In India's case, you know, it used to be two third. It's now coming down to 50 percent, not because of any privatization, but because the private sector banks have been sort of milking it away. Um, I want to talk some, I want to get to America before we open up to the audience. So just really quickly, just paint us a picture about how, how do you see American elections happening, shaping up? What will the impact of that be on India? Just broad strokes about where you think America is. We, I, I'll get to some very specific yeah. questions with regards to America in the rapid fire, but okay. now just for a- I have a rapid fire. Oh, I, have a rapid I didn't fire. know that, okay. <laughs> Um, so I'd say that as far as India's, so I'd say that the U.S. is concerned is that every time you want to feel good about our politics, let's talk U.S. <laughs> politics, right? Because you feel very good about, you know, what's happening here uh, in terms of that. Because, you, I mean, like, look at the betting market today, right? The betting market has a virtual tie between Biden and Trump yep. election again. I mean, what a state of affairs it is that if you have a Biden versus Trump repeat in the election there, and there's no way for me to predict something else Yep. will happen but that. So I'd say that in America's case, the only thing is that their institutions are so strong that politics has become like almost a spectacle, which doesn't seem to impact anything else there. And it's a very federal society. So the state and the state governors do a lot out there compared to what the center does. So it's fascinating uh, to watch. Its actual impact, you can argue, is quite marginal in terms of the world because also because like the dysfunction which is there, because they're, they're so divided, the government there, they're so polarized out there. But it's fascinating to watch. In fact, for next year, I was going to say this point, that um, I would made the point at the beginning of the year that this is a very dull year for elections around the world. If you look at the top countries in the world, hardly any countries are having elections. Next year is the opposite. That I don't think there's going to be a year where so many elections in so many key countries is happening next year, with obviously India and US being the two most meaningful ones, yeah. but then everyone from Mexico to Indonesia to possibly the most significant election that nobody talks about, at least here, is that in January there's an election in Taiwan. And if the pro, if the anti-China party there, DP, uh, if they come back to power, that could really you know, begin to rattle the China and may even precipitate them into doing something quicker or like on their time scale they have. So lots of great elections. U.S. election is a great spectacle to watch, yeah. what, but this, it'll, it'll be impossible to call it, and I think that very hard to like, uh, know between these two as to who's going to win at this stage. It's is, like, is the Taiwan thing real? Like you think, you know, irrespective of who gets elected in America, do you ever think this, the, Ch the Chinese-Taiwan tension, how real is it, how much? No, it's very right? real, but it's one of those you know, unpredictable things, which is that it's in forecasting. You don't know what to do with something which is a 20% probability, but that 20% probability is such a catastrophic probability that how do you plan for it? You have to factor it in somewhere in your mind. Somewhere in your mind, but it's, very, it's so difficult, right? Well, it's 20% that, that something goes there. But the 20% of something happening there is the consequences are... And during this uncertainty, 
you know, where, who would you bet on for the chip wars to win? I mean, would you bet America winning the chip wars? India has a stake in it? No, like, America's already won that war. Yeah. I'd say that as far as the tech dominance, AI, etc., America's just winning that war. And Semiconductor supply, the, all of that, you think America? No, I'm saying that in generally, the reason why the American market has done so well and the, and the reason the American economy is being so resilient is mainly because of its tech sector. Now, I do feel there's a problem in America that the tech sector is so concentrated among six, seven players. But let there be no doubt that the, uh, only, the, big, the biggest comparative advantage America has and why so much investment keeps flowing into America even now is because of its tech sector. So that debate, I think, America had... I mean, that's the difference. Like in Europe, um, we did this sort of very interesting work that if you look at America's top companies, they are all tech companies. In Europe, all the, te all the top companies are luxury companies, you know? Luxury so, brands, yeah. yeah. So they have, you know, like in terms of all the luxury brands are top in, in, like, in like Europe, the Hermes, the LVMHs, they are the ones. No tech, virtually. I think only one company in the top 10. In America, of the top 10 companies, six, seven are tech. We uh, keep hearing this term tech colonialism. You know, unicorns in India, though they have succeeded hugely, but essentially, you know, you, have, you get the Chinese investors, Japanese investors, and U.S. of course, U.S. investors of course. So no real substantial wealth creation is happening within the country. That's one. And the other part of tech colonialism, which is coming up, the big tech, is at the forefront of this AI. Yeah. You know, they are the ones uh, who are investing because the entry barrier has become so high. So you don't get those disruptors. Do you think that is a valid argument? Absolutely, but I think that's valid globally and the US. In fact, I'm in the process of just wrapping up my, you know, like I'm just writing my new book, uh, which will come out next year. Uh, like hopefully by the time we chat next year, it should be out. But my main argument is this, that something has gone really wrong with the fact that the domination is taking, that generally when you get a new wave of innovation, you get a new wave of companies who also come at the forefront. This time, the difference is that the AI wave is largely being ridden by companies which are already very established. So I think this is a global problem, not an Indian problem, but a global problem primarily led by America uh, in terms of that. So I think this is a problem with America and what the regulations have done, which have backfired. In many ways, the regulations that they have tried to create... For, for tech? For yeah, for tech. Uh, the regulatory environment has like, ended up helping the incumbents because it made the cost and the barriers to entry so high for new people to come in. That's very difficult. Like in America, I, I see it personally, that setting up a new fund or anything in America today, the regulatory cost is so high yeah. that it's become very difficult to set up new things. Again, there will be new businesses, but I'm saying the rate, if, this is data, that the rate of startups in America is declining. In, you know, that's you know, one piece that you said, which I was a little surprised by, because I thought that for an investor like you, the fact that Apple is stable and is able, or, or Google is stable in the advent of a disruptive technology like artificial intelligence, the fact that these companies are able to, you know, rise above and take it in part of their stride and kind of benefit from them is a good thing because I felt that, you know, I mean, look at the size of these companies. If they get disrupted by a mom and pop who starts up, like, you know, like, like Microsoft did when it started off, I thought that would be a structurally a very sort of tough no, thing. No, I think that's the opposite. I think capitalism should be always supportive of creative destruction. You want new companies to come, you want the established. If you look at the top 10 companies in the world in the last 50 years, every decade, if you look at the top 10 companies, eight out of nine change. The last tech boom which that's happened in 1999, 2000, uh, like those companies like Cisco and all, they've gone. Intel, Cisco, where are they today, right? So. That's what should be the nature of capitalism, that you can have new companies which come disrupt. So the fact that Apple is still so dominant is to me a damning statement on, the, on capitalism more than anything else today. I think that's a good, that's a good headline for this Adda. Uh, before we go to the audience questions, a, a quick one on uh, just this idea of Atman Nirbharta and what Jayashankar said yesterday, re-globalization. Um, I, I see us doing it also in tech in India now. Also, I mean, you know, specifically in tech, which we kind of, for a long time, Indian government has kind of kept a huge distance from. Now I see, you know, we had an adda here with, uh, with Rajit Chandrasekhar about a month ago. Um, I mean, they're like waiting to regulate, India's waiting to regulate tech in India. Um, 
are we taking atmanirbharta too far if we do that or is it good should we be protective about no i think that i'm not sure what they are doing i don't have the details but in general they seem to be pretty uh inviting of foreign capital they want foreign capital to come and you know a lot of foreign capital has come so i'm not sure the talk matches right. the reality if if this uh, this goes back to one of our points that I, i'm more concerned about domestic businesses and the fact that if you think that most domestic businesses are corrupt and you keep on having you know like you keep launching all these investigative stuff i'm more concerned about that yeah. on foreign capital i think generally they've been inviting of course there are lots of issues that, you know that even foreign capital will complain to you about that you know this is not done and that's not done and there's too much regulatory and tax stuff but i'd say that the that I, that i even as a so called foreign investor but as an indian above that would want the government to focus more on engaging with domestic business that you know how to keep domestic business at home why are you leaving out rather than just saying that oh these are corrupt people leaving the country no often corruption is because the regulatory system is such where people are escaping it uh, not because of anything else right perfect shamash we go to audience show anything more uh, just one uh, i don't know whether you have seen the uh, data privacy bill that, uh, which came out and, and was passed by parliament do you think that uh, you know every other sector has been included except the government government has uh, exclusion all around do you think this, that's the way to go i mean compared to eu also has uh, done something like it's not that only india has done is regulation of ai is uh, a must or because a free ai can, is cannot uh, help anybody do you think that's uh, some kind of a regulation i haven't seen this so like closely as to what our approach here is in terms of it but generally i think that the problem is that as i've said in both europe and america and europe in particular the regulation has backfired in many ways that it's held up it's it's ending up helping the incumbents and preventing more startups from coming so i'm really concerned about the regulatory state and how that's backfiring in terms of the dynamism of capitalism uh, so that is my bigger concern with the regulatory architecture in general okay can you show of hands just to please i get to sense your mic to mr nanda here please yes I also, I, I mean, there are some incredible fund managers who I met while walking onto the stage. So I, I, I do want their comments and questions also. So I, if you don't put your hand up, I'm going to if call on you. If it's only markets, I'll withdraw. No, 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 please, uh, Mr. Sharma. I share your optimism. I'm a born optimist. But three things keep worrying me. You know, at 75, you worry more. So one is that India will see a more K-type growth than, and we've seen that in the past. The rich, the gap between the rich and poor. If you take, and with a population of ours and with you know vulgar display of wealth it's something which causes me a little concern the second thing is that you talked about opportunities and you talked about fourth option i was personally very optimistic post post the asian crisis now see what happened we could not capitalize it and in fact in the 90s or late 80s i had put up a water plant in of all places in tirupur the first private water supply company in the country because we were the textile kings today bangladesh sells four times more exports of textile than we do you look at our export figures you know you talked of fdi coming down but you look at our export figures we have been saved thanks to you talked about us sanctions the us sanctions saved us because we could get oil at the prices that we got you know and my other question off the record everything <laughs> everything today as i see it is filtered through isse vote ko fayda hoega ki nahi hoega yeah but i'd say that that's how india has always been I, okay maybe but i think that's how india has always been and you other two and i said that i've Uh, what you are saying is something which i agree with that this is uh, i i said so this is the fourth wave of great foreign interest this time it's possibly even larger but i mean we can all be cautious about it in terms of you know where things are but as i said on a relative basis it's hard to not be too optimistic on india today it's just because yeah 
No, but the, again, uh, like it happens if, on, on a global context. This K factor is a very global phenomenon. Wealth inequality today is at a record high in the US as well uh, in terms of that. So this is the issue. But having said that in India, because of things like digitization, you see that a lot of the poor people are getting much more benefits today, reaching them, than was the case 5, 10, 15 years ago. That has changed for sure. And we can see that on the ground. So, uh, you know, this is India for you. I mean, there are so many lines about India on this. I've always used a line which you know about, which is that this is a country that's consistently disappointed the optimists and the pessimists. There are other people who say that whatever you say about India, the exact opposite is true. So it's a complicated, complex nation. And I can go on about the, the positives and the minuses. On balance, as I said, that it's hard to be, like, it's hard, you know, uh, as long as you're measured about what your expectations are, I think that the path today does look relatively optimistic, uh, economically at least. Just, you know, I'll just, just take a question. Bangladesh and Vietnam, they're two countries that keep coming up in every conversation that I've had about economy yes. in India's yes. position. So any, is there a short, like, kind of a lesson to us about, wow, we as a, not government, but we as in private uh, can learn from no, Bangladesh I'd say that and Vietnam? What Vietnam is doing is, basically it's the mini China today. Whatever China did, 20, 30 years ago, Vietnam replicating that. But Vietnam can do that. Whether we can do it, I'm not sure, right? Because of the fact that, as I said, that the political society is very different than Vietnam. You're saying that the, our democracy, our noisiness is a cost? Is that the difference between... No, but the noisiness also leads to positives also, right? Because, the po because you know, on this I've done research, by the way, that is democracy or an authoritarian regime better yes. for economic growth. The exact result is it's exactly equal outcomes. But here's the difference, which I think people forget, that under democracy, the outcomes tend to be narrower in terms of the range. Right. Under authoritarian governments, the range is massive. So if you end up getting a good government, you can end up getting 8 9% growth. Or in Africa or even Latin America, you end up getting some yeah. uh, crappy government, and you can disappear from the scene, like Argentina. And, you know, I mean, uh, although now it's a democracy, but in the past, some of these countries in Africa and all under dictatorships, Right? They just completely got wiped out. So it's a much more volatile trajectory. So I think that's the key distinction to make uh, in terms of democracy versus authoritarian. Interesting. Sure. Yes, please. Rashmiji, then we'll go. Go ahead. Uh, two questions. First is that uh, India is a socialist country, basically. <coughs> a lot of things are being given free by the government, whether the state government or the central government. What is the long-term impact of it on the economy? Secondly, this new world economy order is coming up. <laughs> Russia, yeah. China, Iraq on the one side. On the other side is US and the other countries. Where the India stands? <laughs> okay, like on the first question, as I said, that the impact is already there, which is that there are only limited amount of money. The more you end up spending on welfare, the less you will have to spend on infrastructure. So even though the infrastructure is going on, it, and it's quite impressive, the infrastructure rollout, the more you have on infrastructure, uh, on welfare, the less you have on infrastructure. So that automatically reduces your long-term growth potential and productivity, but that's the reality you have to live with. On the second part, I think India has managed it quite well so far, which is that there are these, I mean, you're right, that the world is getting much more fragmented. But India has done a pretty good balancing act between these two different spheres which are there around the world. That way, I think that India has done a relatively decent balancing act, and we need to do more of that. In fact, I'd say the best countries today are the ones which can exploit the differences between the two camps. You know, Indonesia is like a classic example. Uh, it's a government that I sort of talk to a bit at times. They're doing the same thing. So I think it's a great time. You know, that old line used to be when two elephants fight in the jungle, a lot of grass gets trampled, but here the two elephants are fighting the jungle. I think a lot of the smaller ones, or the so-called middling paths, this is an ideal time for them. You play off both of them. Please, then we'll go Mr. Jivrajka. And if I can get some hands from the back, I would like, yeah, get them, yes, please. Okay, good. Yeah, hi, Richard, uh, thank you uh, for, for, I think, a great analysis. The question I have is, Maybe I'm too close to the mic. Uh, the question I have is more to do with the fact that MNC companies in India end up trading at a premium to their domestic peers. 
and it brings me back to, I think, uh, in our fund where we actually look out for stocks or companies where the promoter's selling out, especially mid-cap companies. In fact, a big theme that we've noticed in the past about six, seven years is global private equity funds buying out promoter stakes in listed mid-cap companies yes. and keeping the companies listed. There's an instant re-rating of the stock in 12 months. In fact, the four stocks that we bought in our first fund gave an average return of about 85% in the first two years itself. When will this stop and at what point will, and are you seeing this in other emerging markets where MNCs come in and there's an instant re-rating, assuming that the, you know, almost telling you that the previous promoter wasn't very good and now the PE funds or the strategic investor will turn this company around, better corporate governance and so forth. Yeah, I think that, you know, Firstly, this is much more amplified in India. I don't see this happening in too many other countries. I mean, because, I mean, uh, like, like this is there. And I'd say that in terms of, it, it depends, then, like these companies that you mentioned, who ends up running those companies, though? It's still Indians, though. So I think that's the key thing, which is that it's about who's actually running those companies. So what you're saying is that the, by this foreign capital is bringing better corporate governance. But the running is there. Because I'd say that for foreign businesses, if I were to tell foreign businesses to set up Greenfield in India, that's much tougher. I'd rather give the capital to some smart local business people to create the businesses. So I'd say that this is a very important distinction again, which is that who's running those companies. But, but this is very much an Indian, I'd say, quite unique to India. I don't see this happening in too many other countries. Can we get the mic to Aisha back there, the lady in the white shirt? Sushil, please go ahead. Sushilji, please go ahead. Let him go first. During the last one year. Yeah. During the last one year, I think three things have got accentuated. One is the climate change, which is being now felt at the people level rather than only being discussed in certain conferences. The uh, second is the debate about uh, fuel and energy between the fossil fuels, is it going to vanish or, you know, the, the clean energies uh, or both will uh, coexist. And uh, the third is the supply chain disruptions. Now, all these three are bringing about some losers and some winners as far as countries are concerned. Who do you think uh, with these changes are going to emerge as the new winners and where will India stand on these issues? You know, I'd say that, again, it's a theme I've spoken about in the past, if it be a bit careful about this whole energy transition bit, because, you know, despite this, the price of oil is still nearly, nearly $80 a barrel, because hardly any new supply is being allowed to come up around the world, on the commodity side, including on oil. So I think this is a much more long-term transition, which is that this will happen, but we have to be careful that there's a interim phase where a lot of capacity is not coming up. It is very hard to, to set up a new copper mine in Latin America, in Chile, in Peru. These countries, you could virtually go in and do what you felt like. Today, because there's so much of sort of, you know, activism against this, it's become a lot slower. So I'd say that this idea of, you know, like it's, it's happening in parallel, but like the, one of the greatest growth stories in the last few years has been where? The Middle East. There's, you know, Saudi Arabia, it's booming. You go to Dubai, it's like booming. UAE, it's booming. These are oil economies. The reason they're doing that and they've got a longer lease of life is because in the Western world and other places, you've completely choked supply. There's no supply. So demand may be being cannibalized with EVs and other things, but supply has been totally cut off. I think so we have to think much more strategically about this, that eventually we all want a cleaner world. I'm all for that. But if you're going to cut off supply, you're allowing these things to go on for much longer. So that for me is the big debate today, that why is the price of oil still at $80 a barrel in, in a slow growth world and the fact that so much, because supply is being constrained everywhere. So I think that we all want a better environment. We all want that to happen. But how to get from point A to point B is something which I think we still haven't quite grasped that what the consequences could be. Because you touched on it, and get to the question, because you touched on it, um, one of the things that we learned in the, after the war the, is that a lot of the Russian money was welcomed by the, by the Middle East, specifically by Dubai. And this idea that UK kind of just was the, you know, the financial sort of capital for the world, 
is now kind of shifting to Dubai because they were just more open and I guess less strict about whose money was parked and how the money kind of gets yeah. traded. Is that also, like, how big of that is a factor to Dubai and the Middle East? No, I'd say, but even Saudi Arabia is doing very well. So it's not just Dubai, but you know, so there are two different factors going on here. That, I mean, I again wrote a piece about this. There are three cities around the world which have been big, the big beneficiaries of the post-pandemic world for different reasons. Dubai, Singapore, and Miami, the three biggest. And if you look at the common factor in all these places, that they're all very private sector, business-friendly kind of places. So I think that is the more important factor that in general you have, because you have many cities around the world which are turning the opposite. Like in New York, you know, the top tax rate in New York is 55%. Uh, you know, like, so, like, how long can you keep on squeezing that? What is it in Miami? In, like, Miami, it's, like, uh, less than 40%. That's a huge difference, right? I mean, just you change your residence from New York to Miami, and, like, a person making a million dollars a year, which in America is... is not that is, uncommon. It's not that uncommon. Your tax bill drops by $150,000. Yep. I mean, that's substantial. So I think that this idea that you, if you have too many places which are anti-capital anti-business, like in New York, I remember having this conversation, um, I was, you know, uh, I wear two hats as an investor and as a writer. The good thing is sometimes you can just show up wherever you want with whatever hat. There was a writer's round table somewhere happening about like New York City and stuff where they, where they called me to, uh, you know, like just be part of it. And like uh, all these very left of the center people were there on that uh, table. And then like, you know, they were all like, uh, Capital is moving out of New York, really, and they're all feeling very happy that, you know, almost as if they can get cheaper tickets to see Hamilton and, you know, like, and they can sort of, you know, get their cheaper apartments there. And then I said the same thing that, listen, this may be good, but 45% of the entire tax revenue in, the, in, in New York comes from the top 1%. How much are you going to kill them before you kill your own tax revenues and they keep moving to Miami? And the response from a very otherwise cerebral left-wing professor was let all these douchebags move to Miami. You know, so if you have that kind of attitude where you repel people, then you're likely to get consequences. Okay, super. Aisha. Hi. Yes. Um, on a very global macro level, if we were to take a board and put all the countries on it and look at their current account deficits and fiscal deficit, we see countries that are net borrowers and lenders. Uh, with respect to, like, say, the U.S., China, South America, and, you know, India, and maybe Saudi Arabia. Does this concern you at all? Because there's been countries that have been borrowing and borrowing and borrowing for years. So how is this cookie going to crumble? No, I think that as far as the... Uh, I think the big one there is the U.S., right? Because if you look at the rest of the world, the borrowing um, deficits are coming down now a bit. At least they are not as wide as they had become. The only country where the borrowing binge is carrying on is the US. I think that at some point in time that concerns me. So far, the issue with the US is because of the tech boom, because of AI, because as, well, uh, as the comments you also made at the opening, that there is no alternative. Capital keeps on flowing there. So the entire game is when does the US, the, as the world's economic power, run out of this? The fact that, I mean, like, it's unthinkable that the US used to run a budget deficit of 3% of GDP for the last 20 years on average, let's say. Now it's 6% of GDP, and yet everyone is still sort of buying dollar assets, uh, you know, in terms of that. So I'd say that the issue is when does the U.S. run into trouble on this? I think that is the key nation. E elsewhere, I think that things have come off a bit. Things have improved a bit. Uh, you know, like places like Greece and all have come out of the crisis with some improvement, I'd say, of this. But the U.S. is the big question. When does it come to do that, but because they are the, the world's reserve currency and they have so much economic power and the tech boom carries on, you know, it's very hard to know as to when that ends there. There's another question in the back, yeah. <coughs> uh, Richard, uh, this is Prashant, uh, great conversation, thank you for that. My question is that last two decades India has grown around 6% a year, while working age population definitely will grow slower by about a percent or so, but we are likely to face a simultaneous increase in exports of both services, non-software, driven by remote working and manufacturing. Don't you think that could actually accelerate the growth rates to maybe 7-8% instead of the 5-6% that you mentioned? 
No, that's possible. But as I said, that in terms of the fact is that um, we have to also have a look at how fast the global economy is growing, Prashant, right? Because if you look at the global economy historically, and you look at India, India has never been able to grow at a rate of more than, let's say, 3% faster than the global economic average on a sustained basis. In the boom which took place in the 2000s, right? When, I mean, if you recall in the 2000s, our export growth was 30% a year in those boom years, 03 to 07. 30% a year. The global economy was growing at 4.5%, 4.5%. You know, 4 Emerging markets were growing at 7%. We managed to grow at 7 8% in that era. Today, if the global economy's underlying growth rate is 2.5%, because of demographics and debt and stuff, if for India to grow much above 5 6%, even with export growth of quite which is quite strong, would take a lot. So it's entirely possible, but, but my point is the fact that it is historically would be unprecedented. Uh, but I guess that's what the market is pricing in, right? That's why we are the most expensive market in the world, that we are pricing in some of that optimism. So historically, we have never grown at a rate of more than three points faster than the global average uh, or, 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 or so. And I'm basing my forecast on that. Now, there are both... I can draw both upside and downside scenarios to that. Your scenario may lead to an upside surprise. There can also be a downside scenario, that we have too much competitive populism, uh, you know, which sort of gives away a lot of it. We spend too much on that. Uh, that you know, at a time when the cost of capital around the world has gone up so much, the amount of capital we can draw may come down. Uh, right? FDI is already down. I don't know why that's happening, but that. So I'd say that you, you have to have a base case, and then you can have a really bullish or a really bearish case. Uh, but my base case is based on the fact that the historical norm for India in the post-opening uh, world of the, of the 91 era has been that you've typically grown at a point about three percentage points faster than the global average. Mr. Mehta, please go ahead. Thank you so, so much for your super presentation. Just one question. There's this famous saying, do not fight the Fed. Do you agree with it or you don't? No, in terms of the fact is that the cost of capital has gone up, and I think that slowed things down. So I think that's a, that's a fair assumption, which is that the cost of capital around the world today is a lot higher, and the returns have slowed down in general. The U.S. market is being propped up by five, seven big cap stocks, but beneath the surface, I think that if you look at the funding environment in general for private equity or everywhere, things have slowed down. So you're absolutely correct that if the cost of capital has gone up, it makes for a more challenging environment. The Fed is the primary determinant of the cost of capital. So that's changed. So yes, that's, that's true for now. There's a question there, please. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, we've really seen the end of zero interest rate policies, but not really the end of QE. Are you surprised that we've come out of uh, a period of low interest rates with no real consequences? It's too early to say because of the fact that even in, even in 2000, you know, people remind me that even in 2006, seven, the tightening, the Fed kept tightening till 2006. The crisis did not hit till end 2007. So I'd say that, you know, it takes a while for these things to play itself out, but you're right. Um, am I surprised by the resilience of the U.S. economy so far? Absolutely. You know, like uh, somebody was giving me this estimate today, and I can't even believe it, that the Atlanta Fed in the U.S. looks at these indicators. That the U.S. economy in this quarter is currently tracking a growth rate of 5 to 6%. That's insane, right, in terms of it. But a lot of it is also because of the fiscal spending I was talking to you about. That the amount of government spending happening in the U.S. today under the name of a new industrial policy, the CHIPS Act, or whatever is incredible. So I'd say let's wait. It's too early to say what the cost of capital will be and how that will play itself out. Yes, is there a question there? Yeah, please go ahead. We'll just spend a little bit more time on questions than usual because I want to, I know, and where, is Bharat Bhai still here? Can I, I'm gonna call him, can I, I'm gonna put him on the, on the spot but ask for a comment also for him. Please go ahead. Thanks. My name is Naval. Uh, why hasn't the Fed increased the pace of QT? They've been increasing rates, but why aren't they pulling liquidity out? One question. Second is, why hasn't India been able to produce a global MNC? Right. Uh, so, like, two of the thing answers there. 
The first one, I think, is the fact that the Fed has been doing some QT, but it backed off a bit when this whole SVB crisis happened. So in a way, this is the culture of the US today, which I have a problem with. I was talking about like, you know, like, I mean, a new book I'm working on, which is that there is a total bailout culture. At the slightest hint of trouble, the Fed, the government rushes to the rescue. And I think that that has again happened with the SVB crisis, in a way. Now, the question people ask me is, but would you let SVB go bust? Would you have, like, et cetera? I'd say that maybe not, but that is what undermines capitalism and productivity if you keep bailing out companies, keep doing this kind of stuff. So that is my one point as far as the uh, thing that, that wh why has not more happened? Because they had an SVB crisis, possibly because of that. Uh, yeah. Yes, it is. Well, in terms of, I don't know, the Fed has to answer that. But I'd say the fact is that the, the general problem, the malice, I feel, is that the, there is a bailout culture which is deeply there, which is that there's a lot of fear about not letting anyone go bust, right? So that's the one. The second question, sorry, if I can... Global MNC. Yeah. On, you know, in terms of the fact is that, uh, it, that very few countries do at this per capita income level. It's very difficult. Even China and stuff like that, they created the Tencents and, uh, and others. But it's very difficult to create these companies out of here at this per capita income level. So I'm not that stressed. As I said, the number of good quality companies in India is phenomenal. So I'm quite happy taking that. Uh, in terms of that, Korea created Samsung, but it has the worst corporate governance culture of any country I know. The total returns of the Korean stock market uh, compared to India are minuscule. Uh, you know, like in, um, when I first joined this business, I used to joke that the Kospi index in Korea used to trade at 2,000. Today, it's still at close to 2,000, right? So I think that this obsession with having a global MNC, yeah, it's good for vanity. I'm not sure it's necessarily the most productive thing for an economy. Samsung uh, and Korea is being a case in point. How many more questions, comments are there? Can I just get a quick sense? Okay. Uh, Rashmi ji, with Mr. Shah, we'll go back to three more questions. Please, uh, Mr. Saluja first. Sorry, sorry. Akush, can I, can I ask you for a comment? Anything to the day? Please. So, a little longish comment. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about valuation, <clears throat> there is tendency to be very mathematical about it. And <clears throat> Cheapness or expensiveness uh, typically is measured like a price earning multiple, which is a very fickle way to describe valuation. Uh, <clears throat> valuation is really an outcome of two important uh, factors. One is the growth and the strength of that growth over a period of time. The second factor which is very vital is the quality of growth. And the quality of growth comes from three, four sub-factors within that, which is longevity, other things being equal, a growth rate which will be for a longer factor creates a greater value. Second, predictability, something which looks more certain has a greater value. Thirdly, the capital efficiency, or the return on capital employed, return on equity. Therefore, Mathematical nuance is very easy for everyone to compare across markets, across sectors, across businesses, but it is usually false. It is the quality <coughs> of growth which is really determinant of predictability of the returns that you make. I'll give one uh, uh, comparison. Take last 30 years. Uh, and take the three most important uh, markets of the world, America, India, and China. GDP of America grew 3.8% in 30 years, but the markets produced 9.2% return. India grew at the rate of 8.5% in that period. Market returns were about 8.3%, almost one for one. America, 3.8 and 9.2, so one for one unit of growth, about 2.3 units of an outcome. China, an incredible growth rate, 13.5% of GDP, with the market returns of 1.9% compounded, 
one unit of growth had to work so hard to get only 0.15 unit of outcome. The mathematical part of the growth rate is easily understood as if it is one for one. But the addition or the subtraction comes from the quality. In America's case, one unit of growth, 2.3 unit of an outcome, 1.3 came from quality, governance, predictability, solidity, etc. In case of China, huge deduction, one unit minus 0.85 to arrive at 0.15. And in case of India, one for one. In my opinion, I think China's growth rate, I agree with Ruchi, is smashed. And forget about 13 and a half, forget about double digit or high single digit, they'll struggle to get even a small number. India on the other end, in my opinion, will raise the game both on the quality as well as the growth rate. America, I think, is both the hands where there is some amount of skepticism, rate of growth as well as the quality of growth. Therefore, in my opinion, I think in 30 years, the two best performing markets were the, you know, America followed by India. But if I have to make a prediction for a period ahead, in my opinion, it will be India, which will come up trumps. I'm assuming. I'm assuming yeah. you agree largely with what... Yeah, I mean, I broadly agree with him, yes. which is the fact that I, I don't look at, you know, when we look at countries, we look at 10 factors. A lot of those are quantitative and, and not just India. But I think that, so I agree with you broadly on this. And the fact of the matter is, but I'll just make a couple of qualifications here, that all that valuations tell you is what the expectations are. That's all. Yeah. They're not a basis for investing in anything. They're just a telling you what the, what the expectations are, and you just have to be mindful of that. But I totally agree that when, you, when we do cross-country work, we don't look at valuations, we look at fundamental factors, and the quality of growth is important. It's very popular today to bash China. I've been a China bear, as you well know. I'll just make a couple of points that the China numbers are a bit misleading because many of the companies were not included in the index. The Tencent, the Alibabas, and all which became these global behemoths, they were not included in the index. I did not know that. Yes. I didn't know yeah. Alibaba yeah. and Tencent were not part of the China. Exactly. So, you know, they're, uh, so they're not, a uh, lot of these companies are listed in Hong Kong, they don't have a China listing, Chinese, are, or, or some of them just have a US uh, ADR listing. So the entire tech sector, or many companies in China did not, were not included in this index. So I, in India's case, we tend to flatter ourselves a bit by looking at this one index of China. But a lot of these Tencent Alibabas, which became behemoths until Xi Jinping had other plans. These companies were not included in the Chinese index. Rashmi Ji. Just a simple observation. In fact, uh, predicting Indian economy is not so easy because uh, every time there's a change of government and then there is not a continuity of policy. So how exactly we feel so strong and strengthened up feeling that, okay, this is how next year is gonna be, next year's election, waiting for it all. How does it happen, one? Second is, in the MSME space in India, now that the big daddies of the industry are getting into it. So it really is how we actually look at the MSME space. I was re uh, reading Indian Express and a very higher up uh, RSS functionary. He actually said that it's the whole concept of promoting and stabilizing MSME is actually going haywire. Yeah, so on the first point, as I thought we sort of said, that, it, that in India's case, the growth has been one of the most predictable growth rates in the world, simply because the formula which I've always used is if you have a global economy grows at X, add three points to it, India grows at Y, right? And it, India's volatility of growth rate has been one of the lowest in the world, if you look at it. You have countries like Turkey or countries like, you know, like Brazil, et cetera, where the growth can swing wildly. In India's case, the growth, if you look at it, has been relatively, so firstly, Forecasting anything is very difficult, right? But yet we all do it. Uh, as a wise journalist once said that only fools predict the weather, yes, yet, mo uh, yet most people do, right? So we, if you're forecasting anything, it's very difficult. That's a given. Having said that, on a relative basis, predicting India's growth path, regardless of politics, compared to other countries, has been relatively easier because of this simple formula that I've given. Now, if this formula goes broke, then we'll have to have a separate conversation. Uh, although I think there are enough people in this audience where the optimism is such 
where people think the formula may go broke on the upside rather than the downside. <laughs> uh, so I think that's the other thing. We will take two last questions, yeah. uh, Naman and then Mr. Shah, please. Yeah. Nuchir, I think a lot of the optimism that we've been talking about hinges on the fact that we'd be able to produce both enough jobs and high quality jobs. So some thoughts or prescriptions on how might we actually go about job creation at scale and of a certain caliber? Yeah, so you're completely correct that India's growth model is such, we were just talking about it in among the team discussion today, that this is well documented. India's growth model is such where a lot of the growth is happening in the service sector, in that kind of stuff, which typically don't tend to be as labor intensive as manufacturing, like Korea, Taiwan, China. The manufacturing sector is what really drove them higher. And in India's case, the manufacturing growth has been much slower. It's been there, but much slower. So that is, again, if you want to be bearish about India, and as I said, you have a central case of 5-6%. What is the downside? It is the youth unemployment rate being very high. You know, in China's case, is the youth unemployment is 20% today, and people, it's got a lot of attention. In India's case, we don't know what numbers to trust in terms of what, you know, what the youth unemployment rates are, but by some estimates, it's also well, well in the double digits uh, in terms of the youth. So that is undoubtedly a fault line as far as India is concerned. The high growth has to come because of manufacturing. Uh, service sector can never be that labor intensive. So the prescription is, is not mine, but it's there for the East Asian experience. It all has to come from the uh, manufacturing sector growing much quicker than what we have out here. Yes, please. please. please keep it a little short, we're a little short of time. Thank you for being the voice of reason and uh, objective in a world where everyone has rah-rah views about everything. And so many people here follow your books. I've had the privilege of hearing you on both sides of the Atlantic, being a Silicon Valley entrepreneur myself. And there's one thing that stands out is, I look to you, to Ray Dalio, a few others, for objective, numbers-based views without getting politically biased or ideologically biased. The panel and the audience has asked some great questions, so mine is gonna be relatively straightforward. It's an Occam's razor question. You already put some guardrails around, said that you're not gonna answer anything with a 10-year window or beyond. So if Ruchir today speaks to a younger Ruchir 30 years ago, and we're giving him advice about what to do, what would he be saying? And I'll give you three options, but you can make up a fourth, right? Here's a half million dollars as the going-in position, and 30 years of a career ahead of you. So go into AI and become a tech entrepreneur. Do what Ruchir did and become a writer and an investment banker and whatnot. Uh, get a golden visa and get the hell out of here, wherever you want. Or something else. So this is, a, this is my question to you. Because we talk about demographics, India's young dividend, and, and really the future belongs to them. So that's why this question. Well, I don't know, as I said, uh, that I look back and I just got, you know, in terms of very lucky in one way, if I can sort of say so, which is that um, 30 years ago I was graduating uh, from undergrad. Uh, I mean, like I was still in, uh, um, I had a, like I was writing and stuff. Uh, I got lucky in, like in one simple way. There were people in my class and my uh, college who were obviously more intelligent than I was. I got lucky in one way. At a very early age, I knew exactly what I wanted to do which is that I wanted to write and I wanted to invest based on uh, macro analysis. So I started doing that at a very young age. I started writing for the Economic Times when I was 17, 18 or something. And so I just got lucky. But given the advice, I keep telling people that I uh, write for the show, I invest for the dough. So let's be clear, as a writer, there is no money to be made. <laughs> so if you, that half a million dollars you want to spend, Writing is a passion, but investing is where, obviously where you make the money. Uh, and I'd say that, I mean, I feel optimistic. The fact that in India, if you know the, the Indian economy well, putting half a million to work out here, I think is where you can get the, uh, some great returns. Of course, today I do feel that lots of emerging markets which are very interesting today, Eastern Europe, Indonesia, some of the other countries. So I would say have a diversified portfolio. Do not get, um, and my, like thing was always maybe for good or bad that that try and diversify don't get too hooked to one thing uh, which is that one country and try and you know spread it out a bit because who knows what happens to one country 
So that's my thing, that diversify to the extent that you can. Mr. Shah, keep it. <laughs> we all didn't hear that bit. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Shah. You know, we're, uh, you talked about China and you sort of seem to say, uh, say that the growth story is over of China. Bharat Bhai used a very strong word, it's smashed. Now, in this Q2 of this year itself, China grew at 6.5% uh, on a $19 trillion economy. It's, uh, we know that it's the country that has the largest number of patents, so in terms of their productivity improvement, in terms of robots, in terms of all the other sort of things. China is right there. Yes. It's the world leader, for example, in EVs today. Everyone imports a technology, including Tesla, from China. So are we really writing off, and also China has this great, uh, we're seeing how it's playing a, a role on the global stage, whether it was with Iraq and I mean, with Iran and with Saudi Arabia, uh, bringing them together. Now what's happened with BRICS also. So are we, are we really writing off China too early and what are the consequences of doing that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, to make it very clear, all I'm trying to say is that the Chinese economic miracle is over. Right, which is the fact that the growth rates that you had in China of five, six, eight, nine percent, that era is over because of the demographics and the debt. But China will always remain a very serious economy because its economic size is 19 trillion dollars. And this six and a half percent growth rate the China government puts out, I mean, I wrote about it, I don't trust it in terms of, you know, there's no evidence on the ground that the, that the economy is in great shape uh, today. So I would say that you have, uh, that you that you correct one of the investments we have, if I can say so specifically, is that I think that BYD is a great company in China uh, for producing EVs. I was surprised that even in India, some of my lots friends of in, exactly, you know, like, like in India, also there are lots of BYDs. So there's a lot you can do with China. It is going to be an economy which, which will not disappear. It's an 18, 19 trillion dollar economy. All I'm going to say is that the miracle days are over, just like with Japan, the miracle days, you know, were of high growth rates are over because of demographics and other factors. So. I'd say the view in China is not that just, in fact, I'm saying the opposite to people today. When people tell me, oh, you're running a fund, uh, can we keep China out of it, right? And I say, no, that's not right. That you can't keep China out of it because it's too large an economy. If you're running a global emerging market fund, you have to at least look at some companies in China. So, but the near-term prognosis is the fact that they have a property sector crisis going on. That is problematic for them. The economic miracle is over. But on a five, 10 year basis, will the Chinese economy be a place that you, uh, which will be around and you invest in at a size of $19 trillion when we are still three and a half? Of course it will be. Super, okay, we're gonna to get to the rapid fire. Uh, Richard, you're familiar with the format. Uh, they're gonna be, uh, I hope, tough questions. And I hope I'm gonna get you to take a position. Uh, the idea of rapid- Lots of positions today. Yeah, which you have, but, but this, is, this is like shorter positions, but stronger okay. positions. Okay. If you have to pick one in India, edtech, fintech, or biotech, what would you pick? Uh, fintech. One advice you'd give the prime minister, you have 10 minutes, 10 minutes with him in a room alone. I, I don't want that I, because I've learned the hard way, giving advice what doesn't work, nobody wants to listen to you. So, with this uh, prime minister or any prime minister? Any, any prime minister. I've had experiences as I've also documented in the past, starting with Putin and stuff, I've never gone back to Russia after that. So <laughs> I, I'm not advice, but my sort of, only observation is the fact that I hope he's, that, he, that today when I see what's happening in the ecosystem in India, that he's getting frank, objective advice. Because there's a tendency sometimes when I notice for everyone to go in, like, you know, just be a sycophant, suck up, say all these things, that everything is good. Every line that you have to say is that about how things are good, how things are great. So I just hope there's always some objectivity on the ground also which he's getting from an ecosystem. That is my only thing rather than this. That's your concern. That's my concern that, that everyone you know, just goes and says how oh, things are just great and how you are doing this and doing that. And then and you don't know what's happening There will always be some data point to show that it is going. No, there are enough, I think we have a, you know, like a long discussion yeah. today, there are enough fault lines, you know, in terms of that, okay, fine, you want to use the investigative agencies to go after the political, fine, but how are they misusing their power then to you know, basically run rampant with lots of people and undermining business confidence. Who's saying that in terms of that? Is somebody giving the feedback? That's my big concern today. 
is sectarian tensions considered in, for, by global investors for India? I've not heard much of it, and I have to say that when I, tr you know, like, I get, it's very disturbing when you read the headlines about what's going on, but when we travel to, across India, uh, I, I do. I think the further you go from Delhi, the more optimistic you feel. I've always that's felt it. Fantastic. So that's the issue. Um, Tata, Birla, Adani, Ambani. Who is the next in this list? By India's definition, it should be somebody else. So who, right? who will be the fifth name? I don't know it because it's, it's very hard to predict, who, you know, in yeah. terms of, uh, but I really, I'm saying that, you know, in terms of, I think in India's case, if I can say so as specifically, the big boom, if India is to make it to the next level in the next five years, is on the investment side. Because consumption is doing fine. It's really investment which needs to pick up. So I would be backing people who, who are playing the investment story in India. Of all the emerging markets you've tracked, which will be the first breakout nation? No, in terms of, I've already, you know, made forecasts about this and stuff like that. I think that, I, as I've said, that, the, that I think that the, let's, you know, make it more specific. That there, in the world today, there are 200 countries that are there, tracked by the IMF and World Bank. Only 40 are classified as developed countries. The balance, 160 are emerging. Many of them from Brazil to Mexico to South Africa have been emerging forever right, 100, 200 years, they keep going round and round, and their per capita income compared to the US never increases. I made a forecast that the next country to join the developed market uh, thing, yeah. th that's another way of putting a question, yes, yes. would be from Eastern Europe. So like a Poland or something like that. So I think that the most overlooked region in the world with the best talent uh, pool, among the best talent pools and great strength of entrepreneurship and other things, is Eastern Europe. So that's, I mean, like, a, and Poland is the largest economy there. I don't even answer this, but how many years before the US dollar loses its position as a global trade currency? It'll take forever, because it's very hard to do that. But I think that, as we discussed, that the seeds of the, that it's Started. peaked, yeah. that the seeds have been sown, and, it, and we are probably, last year was probably peak dollar. If you were the author of a book on the future of the Indian economy, what would you title the book? My favorite line, which I've always said, that this is the country that always disappoints the optimists and pessimists, right? So I'd say that I, we have surprised the optimists so in the last, so the, we have disappointed the pessimists in the last few years because how well India has done. I just hope we don't disappoint the optimists now. If you were to author a book on the future of Indian society, what would the title of the book be? I haven't thought about society <laughs> that much as you far travel as... travel so much of India, you've seen it more than most people here. Yeah. No, I'd say that as far as India is concerned, it's the, like, you know, what like, really st uh, strikes me about India is that we are truly like a United States of Europe, which is that this is not, you know, that the amount of, that the sub-nationalism, the federalism, that is what I find remarkable about India. So, I mean, the United States of Europe is how I look at India from all the travels. If you were the author of a book on the American economy, what would its title be? Okay, I can... That's the title of my next book. I can give it away. Achoo. What went wrong with capitalism? Wonderful. I, I, that's so great. We got a Bharat Jodo Yatra hit miss or makes no difference? Um, again, the objective fact shows that his popularity ratings have improved after. But I fundamentally believe that the next election, if I can say so, will be a, uh, like the 2024 election will be Modi versus Modi. Because there is no one uh, who's going to be able to stand up against him. And the best hope the opposition has is that by not putting anyone up, the biggest, what, the, what he will want and what the BJP will want is the, for them the to face. prop up a face. Because the moment you do that, Modi looks so much better. So the best hope for them is it's Modi versus Modi, where it's a referendum on him and his policies, and, not, and there's nobody else who's up there. 2019, when we did the Adda before elections, you said that it may be close, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, so, but now the third term you're saying is not going to be close. That, no, that's interesting. I have no idea. As it's, uh, the headline that you use for my adda is also very interesting I, because I remember these things. You know, I, my memory is not bad. <laughs> which is that I said anybody forecasting the, that election is a charlatan. Yes, yes. That was the headline. Yes. And I say the same thing today. It's too early. But, you, but, it, but remember what happened then. I think people forget some very interesting details of that election, if I can say so, because yeah. we traveled. Yeah. In 2018, they, the, the Congress party did very well in the state elections in November. 
there was a big momentum build that the BJP is gone. A lot of opinion polls, if you look back at in January of 2019, were showing that the BJP would get 220 or so. This is facts, but this is not my thing. Then you have the like, incident which happens in February, the Balakot. And then a surge starts, which takes them up to 300. So it's so, like, just look at how dramatically things shifted from November, when they lost the elections in December, the betting market and everybody thought that this is going to be a very close election. Opinion polls show you in, in 2019 that they get 220. Then you get February, uh, like stuff, and you have a surge to 300, which, to be honest, we traveled in UP, we, you know, we missed it. Um, what's better for India, an IKEA in a hundred cities or an IIT IIM in a hundred cities? No debate on this one. Yeah. That IIT, you know, in terms of that, obviously, yeah. What's better for India, a strong majority Modi third term or a Modi-led coalition? I'd say that in India's case, given the fact that, uh, you know, like in terms of that, I mean, between these two, I would say that a Modi-led coalition is, you know, something, Everyone privately will say that to you. No one will publicly say that to you. <laughs> and what's better for India, a Modi-led coalition or an opposition-led coalition? Again, it depends who's going to be on the, on the other side. I don't know that. I'd say that what, I think that what we all want in terms of that here, I mean, in terms of in this, in this room, yeah. it's very different from the others. Yeah. As I said, is a, a like system where there are sufficient checks and balances in place. I think secretly that is the desire of at least a lot of the staff. But having said that, I think that we keep overrating national elections because in India the state elections are so important as well. The fact is that India is also very, just like, yeah. like in the United States, we are all obsessed with Trump, Biden, Trump, Biden. Yeah. And you know, the market doesn't seem to care even in America what the hell is going on clearly. Similarly, I think that the state governments in India and the counterbalance that they provide is something which I think is truly underappreciated. Okay. Um, if the opposition coalition were to come power, just to come back to your question, which leader do you think will it's be all good? political questions you're like harumping uh, me with? Only economy <laughs> questions we went through. So <laughs> rapid fire, we go to politics. Yeah, sorry. If the opposition comes to power, which is the one opposition leader you think will make good for Indian economy? I, you know, like in terms of, I don't know if there's one leader in terms of the fact, you know, because they're also aging and, you know, that's the whole, that's the whole point. I mean, I, I think a lot of people in this room I've spoken to, again, I don't know enough. Yep. Like, for example, they all tell me that the best prime minister, you know, the, the question I've asked people, who's the best, pri best prime minister India never had? A lot of people do answer, and I don't know him at all, but although we have met him in our, on our political trips, is someone like a Sharad Pawar. But he's too old now, it seems, to be able to run a coalition government effectively. But I'd say that, you know, that's, I mean, if uh, something like that, I think that in terms of the fact that in, in this room, I think there'll be enough people who'll say, okay. Okay. Um, Biden second term or Trump another term? What's better for India? I think it doesn't matter. You know why? Because I think that India is now in terms of, on, as far as the US is concerned, they're obsessed with China. They really want India on their side. No so it makes no difference. Okay, so we're gonna play a small game now. What's better for India? Go so in terms of what's better for India, good makes no difference or bad. So I'll give you a phenomena, I'll give you an event or a scenario. You tell me whether it's good for India, it makes no difference to India, whether it's bad for India, okay? So Fitch's downgrade for America, is that good for India, makes no difference or bad for India? Makes no difference for, for, because there's uh, countervailing things because that on one hand in terms of the fact that it, that I mean, you know why it makes no difference? Because it's, it, it's made no difference to America. So why should it make a difference to India? <laughs> Ramaswamy's rise in America. Good for India, bad for India, makes no difference. Makes no difference again, because you know, it's too early, it's too fringe, doesn't, you know, it's okay. too early. Xi Jinping's waning popularity in China. I'm saying it's waning, you're, you're, you're not sure, but Xi, Jing, Xi Jinping's dynamic popularity in China. You see, again, in terms of, in terms of, I don't know what to do with that number because that, does he ramp up nationalism? What does he do? You know, like in these countries, and this is my feeling, even with Putin and Russia, we put too much emphasis on the leader, not enough on the society. Right. In, like in Russia, for example, the war, like everyone tells me, has been pretty popular on the ground. And we keep thinking it's only Putin. Wow. So I just don't know, you know, the reality that we know 
and we projected on one leader could be very different on the ground. Okay. The advent of artificial intelligence. Generally, it's good, but I do feel the hype has gotten a bit carried away. I think, for India, it's good for India. Uh, yeah, I think it's okay. generally like it's a productivity enhancing thing in the in the long term. But I think the hype currently is a bit overdone. Okay. An unsolvable Russia-American relationship. Is that good for India or bad for India? I, I think as long as in the world these big powers are fighting amongst each other, it's good for India. Okay. Political instability in Pakistan. I think that's not good, but I, you know what? It's become irrelevant in terms of it. Pakistan, I mean, like in terms of, you know, it's like uninvestable, irrelevant. So it makes no difference to India. Makes no difference anymore to India. Okay, Modi in the center and the states being controlled by opposition, more and more by opposition. Is that good for India? Bad? Generally, I'd say that balance has worked out okay for India because of the fact that, you know, because in India's case, you need, I think, checks and balances. Super. Richard, thank you so much for playing, for taking positions, for answering, not fast, but answering definitively. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just one. Thank you. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Last question, last no, question. Just last a, question. one question. You said Modi-led coalition is better. Can it ever work, Modi being such a dominant uh, personality and everything? Modi I, I was given two choices. I answered <laughs> what I had to answer. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you all for being here. It's been a long question and answer session. Can I invite uh, thank Dr. Thank you, Anand and Shamulda, for the fabulous session. May I now invite Raj Kamal Jha, Chief Editor of the Indian Express, to present a token of appreciation. The illustration is by Shubhajit Dev. I would now like to invite Dr. Rashmi Saluja, Executive Chairperson, Relica Enterprises Limited, to present Ruchir with a bouquet. Thank you, Dr. Saluja. As we conclude, I would like to thank our partners, presenting partner, Religia Enterprises Limited, co-presenting partner, FRR Immigration, 3P Investment Managers, associate partner, VTP Realty, and experienced partner, Club Jolies. Please stay back and join us for cocktails at the Big Top. <laughs>